a more long-term lasting happiness comes from noticing and appreciating the small things around you and thanking them and by extent appreciating yourself because that is really really hard to do as women taking that time recognizing our own value is very very difficult allow yourself to take up your own space and be there to just witness the other women in our lives who may also need support and encouragement to take up their own space you know being able to say hey you know what you're connected to this glorious thing around us and you are a reflection of that and it is a reflection of you and if you can see the beauty and the strength in that then you can recognize that it's in you as well in today's busy world how can we find the inspiration knowledge and energy to live a healthy and empowered life if we balance and harmonize our mind exercise our body live according to the laws of nature and connect to spirit can we find a way to heal become our authentic self and live our purpose with love i am your hostess amy fournier and welcome back to awakening aphrodite Friends, I'm super psyched to share with you my latest obsession, Masterpiece. You know how critical proper detoxification is for a fit and properly functioning body and mind. But in today's environment, it's super hard to detoxify, even if you think you eat well and exercise, I will add. Here are some of the modern day chemicals that wreak havoc on your system. BPAs, graphene oxide, which is found in vaccines, medications, especially the modern day gene therapy, barium, aluminum, lead, all these things are found in chemtrails, which are those white lines sprayed in the sky coming out of planes, arsenic, chromium, cobalt, lead, nickel. These are all things that are found in pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, that's right. Those vegetables, that salad that you had at the restaurant last night, those can have all those poisons and mercury found in any kind of tooth fillings or any vaccines or shots full of mercury. These are all poisons for your body. So how does Masterpiece work? Why is it special? Why is it better than all the zillion other detox supplements that you'll find on any website? Well, in a nutshell, Masterpiece contains what's known as the natural master binder, which is zeolite nano-sized particles. And it pairs that with marine plasma nutrition. And this creates a breakthrough in holistic detoxification. You know, if you wanna geek out on the science, I'll just tell you that harmfully positively charged toxins like heavy metals take up residence in and around your tissues. However, undigestible nanometer sized zeolite found in Masterpiece is a safe negatively charged mineral that magnetically finds and traps those positively charged forever chemical toxins that are strolling around in your body. The body then expels the zeolite with the poisons attached. This is great news, everybody, and no other detox supplement does this. And we have scientifically proven studies to show, and I can testify I'm living proof that it definitely works. That's why I'm sharing it with you. And that's why I put it on my website. I really hope you try it and share it with people and pets you love. I use it every day. Of course, I give it to my dogs and it's really changed my life for the better. Hey, you can find it over on my website, amyfournier.com. Go to recommended products, look for Masterpiece, click on that link, have fun shopping. And while you're at it, check out some of my other favorite products. We all want to feel amazing and we want to look amazing too. And you know, your skin is a big indicator of your health. I don't know about you, but if I don't sleep well, I look like I've aged like 20 years. My skin looks terrible because our skin really indicates the condition of what's going on inside our body. That's why I'm so thrilled to share with you Faro, my newest discovery in skincare. This is a revolutionary approach. It uses traditional ancient wisdom, back to what they used in skincare when life was simple and minimal and fun and easy and effective. Yep, they work with, ready for this? Pig fat, that's right, lard. 
This stuff is perfect if you've got chapped skin, windburn skin, sensitive skin. It's very, very delicate. It's created on regenerative farms. Animals are pasture raised. They're loved. They lead amazing little piggy lives with love and respect and sunshine and all the pig food that they could eat. And they get fresh water and clean air the way that we're supposed to treat animals. But it also works fantastic. I love this stuff. Check it out on my e-store. It's F as in Fournier, A-R-R-O-W. And use my coupon code, Aphrodite. Now let's get back to the show. How do we connect our modern life with the ancient wisdom practices and ways of the past? This is something I struggle with and you probably do too. But if you're interested in the way you feel and what you're experiencing in your life, you know that everything is energy and we have a lot of control and power to influence our energy by the way we curate our environment. I love this discussion today with my guest, Aaron Murphy Hiscock. I have her book, The Green Witch, which is basically like a classic for anybody interested in natural magic, herbology, flowers, essential oils, crystals, getting in sync with the moon, and basically the rhythms of life and nature itself. If you subscribe to Awakening Aphrodite, I'm sure you're interested in this kind of thing. And hopefully you've experienced firsthand the real power of it and how grounding and just reassuring and beautiful it is to live that way. I'm super excited when I reached out to Erin to have her on the show because I've had her book in my library for a long time. She's involved in spirituality for over 25 years, and she really is a leader when it comes to understanding spirituality and the nature connection. She's got a whole bunch of books, and she's also officially trained, but she's just such a down-to-earth person, and I really enjoyed this conversation. I know you will, too, because we talk about curating energy and a misunderstanding about this term, which it's been demonized and it's kind of a trigger freak out word. When you hear, if you hear somebody say, you know, she's a witch, you go, ooh, and you think of Halloween and, you know, dark energy. But I asked Erin about that and she kind of clears that up. We also have a really cool discussion about snakes. You got to listen to that part. And I asked her about cats. It's just a really fun discussion. So if you love animals and you're interested in spirit animal energy, you're going to want to check out that part. And we talk about selling your soul and protecting yourself, dark entities, and help if you feel stuck, what to do. It's a really practical show. I know you're gonna love it. Please check out the show notes to find out more about Erin and her books. If you're interested in this kind of thing, you might wanna also check out the episode I did with High Priestess Jana and the episode with Patty Negri and the Wheel of the Year solo cast I did. Those are just three episodes that are related, but a lot of my shows are because you know I'm a nature lover and we talk about energy a lot. <laughs> so enjoy this discussion with Aaron. And we're back, everybody. Aaron, welcome to Awakening Aphrodite. Thanks so much, Amy. It's so lovely to be here with you today. I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. Like I mentioned in the intro, wow, I've had this book, The Green Witch, which is like, which is like a Bible for many people that are interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, I've had it for, I don't even know, it must be at least a decade. It's been a long time. It's got 4,000 bunny ears on the corners and all the my tabs and everything. And uh, so thrilled when you agreed to come on. And I know, wow, you are a prolific author. I mean, how many books do you have now? It seems like it's more than it actually is because um, a handful of my books, like The Green Witch and um, The House Witch yeah. uh, and Spellcrafting, those are re-releases of books I originally wrote um, in around 2005, 2006. Um, so they were they were redesigned and re-released for a whole new generation of readers. And wow. I they were right. The publisher was absolutely right to do it at this point in time uh, because, wow, has it ever resonated with people? And it's just it's 
it it touches my heart you know be able being able to go through instagram or tiktok and see so many people holding these books and saying this this is what i've been looking for this spoke to me and it's just mm -hmm. oh it makes me it, it just it's it's so heartwarming to know that something i was working out on paper manages to resonate over and over again like this isn't that the coolest thing? I found that even in my work too, because I've been doing this going, going more than three decades now. And, you know, people that'll just all of a sudden out of nowhere be like, I've been following you for, for years or, you know, like you, you get that. It's, it's such a, it's just such a nice little pick me up, especially on the days that suck. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you and know? there are it's those like, days, there yeah. are those days. And, you know, yeah. sometimes we fight so hard for balance and harmony that we forget that, it can't always be perfectly level. Everything is fluid and it comes and it goes. And the low times are just as important as the as the high times because they give us that time and that opportunity to step back and recollect ourselves and just kind of say to our energy, no, it's okay. It's okay. We don't have to fight right now. We can just ride the waves for a little bit. And then when we have energy again, we can move forward. And, and it also speaks to how you said with your uh, re-releasing of your books, uh, you know, we've heard this a million times, life is about timing, right? Yeah. But, but timing is so, so key. And like when you're trudging along and you're following your passion and you're, no matter what it is, you're doing something that you love or you think is important or interesting. And you just are kind of like crickets, right? Like no, no real responses or whatever, but you never know, like, what the ripple effect of that is, you know, and, and who you might be impacting, but, and you're never going to hear about it, you no, know, and it doesn't exactly. mean you're not impacting someone positively, you know? That's it. That's yeah. it. Um, way back, way back when I was in university, I was taking a course on communication at one point, And one of the TAs said, I think it's really important when you read letters to the editor in a newspaper or a magazine, for example, there will be a lot of complaints but for every complaint, there is 10 people who that piece touched who don't write in to say, hey, this really resonated. So knowing knowing that there are those people out there whose lives I've touched and I may never know about it. Yeah, that's that's pretty awe inspiring, actually. And and it humbles me. It really yes, does. Indeed. And, and so like, like me, right? Like all of a sudden you got an email from me saying, I love this book. Like you never would have yeah. known that. Right. So, yeah. So th this is just a shout out to everybody listening or watching that just feels like, you know, am I doing this for nothing? Like, am I wasting my time? And, you know, l let's talk about that. Tapping into your guidance. Tell, tell us a little bit about what got you started and like how how did you follow that compass of like that, you know, taught you this amazing stuff? You know, a lot of it, a, a lot of it was just trying to figure myself out. You know, um, when I was little, I read Anna Green Gables and there's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful line in it where they're talking about going to church and Anne says, why do people go into churches to worship, to connect to God? If I wanted to talk to God, I would go out into the middle of a big green field and I would, you know, just look up and I would feel a prayer. And that's something that really, really resonated. Um, it was exactly what I needed to hear at the time, knowing that, um, knowing that, okay, this may be a fictional character, but the person who's writing it has that idea of, of the divine in nature, the divine in the world around, as opposed to something very separate, something that you, you make space for on a certain day at a certain time to connect to. And it, while it's great to have that time, and I'm sure we'll address it later in our conversation, it's also great to know that you can pause at any moment and connect to those energies around you and know that you are part of something big and wonderful and that that renews itself and cycles over and over and over again you know there's there's no end to it you know it's it's just it's ongoing um and then 
I really started looking into sort of the alternative spirituality thing in university because I was doing some storytelling with some friends. And at one point I thought, well, what, I don't know, what would a modern witch do in this situation? And so I looked it up in the phone book and, oh, there's an, there's an alternative spirituality new age shop. I'll go check it out. And I walked in and Amy, I have never felt more comfortable in a shop before it um the 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 smell the vibes um and i know the vibes are very carefully curated because i ended up working there and i know what Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know you you work hard to create a welcoming environment that is supportive because in a place like that you are actually serving a very broad community of alternative practitioners Mm -hmm. so you want to make sure it's as accessible as possible to you know, whatever cross section you that is going to come in. Um, and I chose three books that day and I went home and I read them. And now this was research, right? So I, I went, sat down with a highlighter in my hand, but the more I read, the more I stopped thinking about the project I was researching for and just started reading for myself. You got lost in it. I got lost in it because it was, I recognized what they were saying. Whoa. And it was something, it was something that really, really led me to look at how religion and spiritual practice had been um, taught to me through my lifetime and rethink of how I could better support myself in a way that was constructive and positive and affirming. So I just, I went back. It went back to the shop and I bought more books and it just, it's, it snowballed from there. Mm-hmm. Well, what I love about your work is it's very similar to the mine because what we're talking about is energy, right? When you yeah. walked oh. into that bookstore, they curated carefully the energy, the energetic feel that people would experience. I know even when I had my brick and mortar physical health and lifestyle club up in New England, I was very cognizant of everything, like, rather than like, what do they call those? Not the waiting room at clubs, but, you know, like the, the, the reception area, I called it the family room. And cause, and I had like bean bags in there and it was really comfy. And we had a lending library with books and, um, I had essential oils. So I tried to hit all the senses, you know, sight, smell, sound, all that. Everything was very carefully curated. So people would literally walk in. I wanted it to be restoring in mind, body, and spirit. So they felt like they were home. They were with family, you know, hence family room. And so obviously that store got that. And this is, this is what, this is what resonates with me too. And and with this energy work. So can you, can you explain to us? And maybe we should even go back a little bit more. People hear the term witch, and I've had several on the show, priestesses and all that, and it's very triggering. And I would love for you to give us your definition of what these terms mean to you before we get in, because what we're talking about is working with energy. So what do you what do you think of a witch? What is it not? Same goes for paganism. Mm. You know, they're, they're such broad terms. Yep. They are really, really broad. And I actually had trouble with the term witch for a long time, simply because if I used it, um, whoever I was speaking with would automatically slot their definition into that word. Yep. So I stopped using it um, for a very long time. Uh, I started using uh, nature-based spiritual path instead. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. For me, which isn't necessarily a spiritual term. It's not a religious term. It's a practitioner thing, as you say. It's someone who who connects to and uses energy to to um, further or accomplish a goal, whatever that goal might be. Um, paganism, I think, being the umbrella term that covers a lot of nature based paths. Um, that isn't necessarily a monotheistic established large religion that we see 
today. Um, usually based in uh, uh, older paths that existed before um, Christianity came and and slowly over the centuries just kept redefining everything until that was because it, it's interesting when you when you look back um, even to uh, you know looking at Tudor times for example they were still practicing certain they were still celebrating certain harvest holidays that looking at them now in through the eyes of a modern pagan a modern nature based uh, spiritual practitioner we would call them key to the wheel of the year um and their agricultural celebrations so those were still happening even in christian times they just wouldn't necessarily and and a lot of the a lot of the activities and events involved in it do have sort of a a pagan feel to them but the church still still incorporated them in their in their practice so you know a lot of this uh, I, I can't define it as non-Christian, for example, or non-Judaic or non-Islamic, because I think all those, <laughs> I may get pilloried for this, all those have aspects of magic to them. Of the conscious use of energy direction to yeah. accomplish a goal, right? Um, witches don't necessarily uh, use deity for that, appeal to a deity. Some do, some don't, some will just use straight energy. Um, so it's it's interesting. I mean, the origin of the term pagan comes from what is it the the Roman term for someone who lives in the countryside? Yes, it's of nature of the land. People yeah, the exactly. Land. So yep. someone who was not necessarily in a city center, who yep. was more who was more agricultural focused or associated, and so you know had more of a chance to participate in that that natural cycle that we tend to be a little unplugged from when we live in urban and suburban areas. And that's actually something that I really like addressing in my work because when we we think of, of witches, like hearth witches or, or wise women or wise men, we think of people living in cottages in this lovely bucolic setting and, oh yeah, sure, that would be great. Except has anyone looked at the price of land lately or the price of building materials, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So being able to access that kind of natural energy, but within an urban or suburban setting, I think is a lot more valuable than wishing you had this thing that we can't have. Because the natural energies are still there. We just tend not to hear them as clearly because there's so much going on. It kind of gets drowned out. Our, our ears get full of this sensory overload metaphorical ears because of course we don't just hear energy we sense it we 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 recognize it even if it's not in a a, a tactile way um but yeah that that i try very hard to make that a key theme in my work helping people to access that natural energy in their everyday lives in whatever location they're in mm -hmm. i love it that's why we're very much aligned. Basically, that's what I do. You know, that's this is very, very important work in bringing our spirituality into a lifestyle, a practice, a way of being. It's not a task I do, you know, or like like every morning I pray or whatever. At night I give three gratitudes or whatever your thing might be. It's it's just a whole way of thinking and being and it's just taking a moment to just pause and like notice the butterfly mm -hmm. right over there that's right on that tree that I'm looking at right now. Just a half a second for me to take it into my awareness, maybe a little wink, nod, appreciation, being aware. It's a way of being. That's a spiritual practice because that's connecting. So I love that you look at your work as you facilitate the connection. So can you give us some details, Aaron, as to how do you help people who are maybe, you know, in a high rise building and the go, go, go uh, working, you know, the typical job and all the crazy and all the distraction and technology. 
How do you help people connect to nature in modern life? Well, the first thing I like to do is remind people that even if they were in like a sealed concrete cube, they're connected to nature because they themselves are of nature, right? I mean, you, it doesn't have to be external that you're connecting to. It's important to remember that you are part of that natural cycle. Um, you, you eat, you sleep, you breathe in, you breathe out. Um, eventually you die and your body will decompose and be be absorbed into the soil and the trees the energy will be released and it will all go back into the cycle. the cycle exactly so you are part of that you are never away from it you're never disconnected i love that that's awesome it's it's very hard for people to to kind of wrap their minds around actually um because I've I've done a few workshops where I'll say, you know, you you are of nature. Even if even if you were in a plane yep. high above the ground, you can do what we call grounding. Right? You connect your energy to the energy of the earth and or the sky mm -hmm. and you stabilize yourself. That way you can either draw up energy if you need it or you can you can slough off extra energy if you need to sort of bring your levels down because you're riding a little high um it doesn't have to be physical and that's mm -hmm. something it's really something that that people have to kind of sit back and think about they really have to take that in um it's it's like hearing that we're all of the divine we're all holy in some way shape or form because people people really don't think of themselves as having divine energy um a lot a, the western culture has really instilled in us that we are flawed mm -hmm. and we and that's that flaw is something to be sorry for or to be guilty about mm -hmm. and i think i think that's that's really really hard to overcome so to think of yourself as having that spark of the divine being able to touch that energy wherever and to honor yourself for having that connection for being part of of that natural energy it's a big step for some people it's it's a really big step and and that's okay right i mean our work our work of of improving ourselves trying to become the best person we can be and the best fit for the energy around us um and to be in a position where we can trade energy back and forth with our environment in order to help one another it's it can be overwhelming and taking that responsibility can be, it can be a lot. It can really, really be a lot. So what I try to do for people is, is say, you don't have to do all the things all the time because that's a great way to burn out really, really quickly or to swamp yourself and just be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So we take baby steps. We do little things. Um, we start from the inside out, no matter where you are, you can touch nature because you are of nature, um, your immediate surroundings, curating the energy in your, in your immediate surroundings helps you level yourself out and have the support that you need. And whether that means removing distractions or moving physical things around a little bit so that it's not so cluttered or busy that that gives you that sort of sensory or energy overload yeah. these these are tiny little changes that you can make that may not seem like logically it doesn't necessarily seem like it's going to do very much but it can and i think one of the things about this path is you have to stay open to the possibility that you could create a change that benefits you and that also benefits the energy around you that you interact with on a regular basis um hello love i know but i'm busy is that your cat we can't she's, see her but but i had the feeling i it sounded like talking to a cat okay she's she's old oh, and there's the tail tail just yeah. walked by we had a tail people we have a tail 
<laughs> she's she's old and she likes to come tell me that it's bedtime even when it's I the middle it. of the day That's awesome. and i and i i was away for a week and she was oh. very unhappy with me for what's that what's your name so. That's Minerva. Minerva. What a great name. Oh right? Yep. Um, You have a couple cats, right? I have three right now. Yeah. Do yeah. you still have snakes? I do. I do. I have uh, a ball python, a royal. You and have I have a python. Two... I oh, do. Wow. I do. He's he's about this long. Oh, and wow. uh, at his biggest, he's about this big. <laughs> so he's big. And he's, he's well, big. he's not really. I mean, like we think we think of pythons as being huge, but he's really yeah. he's only about three feet long max. Okay. And he's a big, <laughs> he's a big baby. He just likes to curl up and stick his head under something and just hang out. What color? Uh he's he's a normal. He's a normal mole. Okay. So he's that that beautiful sort of gold and black. So I have to tell you something that happened to me today. This is amazing. You know, I have four dogs and we go out every morning. And we have our time together and we do different hiking trails or just whatever, different paths. This morning, the morning that I'm going to have you on the show, what do you think was right along our path? Never happened before. Uh -huh. A snake. A snake. And I was like, wow, okay, this is amazing. And actually jumped back. I think it was just a little garden snake. I was trying to get a good look at it. But that's never happened before. And I don't know. I think that's kind of rare up in Massachusetts for snakes, you know. But we are in the spring season just starting. And and today is a gorgeous day. It's absolutely beautiful. It's like 62 and sunny. And here we go. Yay, spring. So I just thought like, oh, God, I got to tell Aaron about this because, you know, a spirit oh, animal, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence. It's, no, it's, it's really interesting because when I was little, um, I guess I must have been about five years old. We used to have um, uh, woods near our house. Yeah. And we would go walking. And in the winter, we would go cross country skiing. And, you know, we would play in there until it was time to go home for dinner. Um, went walking with my family and our dogs one day. And I stepped on a snake. Oh. And again, like you, it was just a little garter snake. And, and, you know, with the wisdom of age, I know that it was a heck of a lot more scared than I was. Okay. But I screamed and my dad had to carry me home because I wasn't walking on that ground. Yeah. Um, so I've always been kind of freaked out about them. In late elementary school, we had that, that um, the project where, you know, you have a whole bunch of animals and tanks and you, you learn about their life cycles and you take care of them. Well, somebody brought in a garter snake and... So it was in one of the terrariums at the back of the room and it had babies. Whoa. And they were the tiniest little things, Amy. And they were, they were just like tiny little silver ribbons. Wow. And he put two of them in my hands. Whoa. It was the first time I'd ever voluntarily touched a snake. And they were, they were so soft and they were so kind. And I went, oh, okay, I see. And so, you know, every once in a while, if I visited friends who had snakes, you know, I'd pet them, I'd talk to them. But uh, I guess it was about three years ago now, a friend, her corn snakes had babies. And I ended up with two of them. And I just, it changed. It changed. I find them very kind, very grounded and calm, which is a funny thing to say about corn snakes because they're zippy. Yeah. <laughs> but their their energy is so grounded. And it's something that... Oh, they're literally on the ground. They have no legs. Literally on the ground, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? But they're calming for me in a way that yeah. I never, ever would have anticipated. You know, with that yeah. first first experience where I freaked out and the snake freaked out. Right. But no, they've, they've brought me so much peace. It's so strange, Amy, because I never, ever would have said, you know, this is one of my things. But I guess now it is. Isn't that awesome? I always say kids and animals are our best teachers, you mm -hmm. know, truly. And, you know, you, you have three cats and uh, I have three, do uh, four dogs, four dogs, and I'm getting chickens very soon working on that uh, and a couple other things. But I wanted to get a cat again. We had cats when I was a kid. We had dogs too. We had everything when I was a kid. But um, I'm just fascinated. I think it's, you know, awakening Aphrodite, this period in my life, the last... Oh God, I don't even know how many years at this point 
I've been doing this deep dive on the whole feminine energy. And um, I've just had kind of an obsession with cat energy. And, you know, it is the ultimate feline diva energy that I am just enamored with. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned from your cats? Confidence. Yeah. Bingo. Confidence. Yeah. Um, they know what they want. They know what they like. They're not necessarily people pleasers. Right. Um, but, and, and, and that's something that I, I really did have to learn. I was very much a people yep. pleaser. Um, it Same. took, yeah, it took me decades to be able to say, wait, I have needs and <laughs> yeah. I, and, and, and I deserve to take care to be taken care of, even if it's by myself. I mean, I have a very caring, loving, supportive family. Holy cow. I am so lucky in that respect, but being able to take time and energy for myself it was very difficult to work against socialization in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, so cats have been an excellent example yeah. of being able to say, no, I want to be on my own right now. Or, no, I'm going to come out and hang out with you. I don't want to interact with you. I, I just want to be in your space with you. Or, sure, I'll let you pat me for a while, but we're done now. <laughs> you know, the, the boundaries... I think are such right. a great lesson from cats. Right on the money. Absolutely. And I think that's why I'm so like fascinated with them. I just think they're just such a great example, such a great teacher. It's just a, it's such a beautiful energy. I love it. So let's talk about what a typical day is like for you, Aaron. And, and, you know, getting back to this incorporating spirituality in our everyday modern busy life. Can you give us a little snippet that maybe some things we can learn that we can borrow? <laughs> oh, I wish I could. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I do all this work in writing these books and, and suggesting to people, these are things you can do during your day to yeah. to touch the energy around you to rebalance yourself to to make sure that you know what's going on around you energy wise and it's it's become so second nature to me that that when someone says well tell us about your day what do you do and i'm yep. like yep i'm the same same thing happens to me i go blank i'm like i don't know i just do what i do i don't even think about it and then people are like oh my god that's amazing what is that and i'm like huh oh i don't even think about it so, i'm just doing a thing yeah <laughs> so so what a normal day would look like for me for example morning i would wake up and i do give myself time in bed to be with my cat uh to think about the day coming up mm -hmm. to sort of do a quick scan see how I feel today, what my energy is like. I will check the weather because I know that's going to impact my energy. Yeah. And being able to account for that ahead of time means that I can be proactive in managing my energy levels. I also have a chronic illness. I have fibromyalgia. So um, the energy available to me is, is not steady. Some days I will be busting out all over and I will do as much as I can. And then other days it'll be, well, okay, obviously it's a day where I'm on the couch with a cup of tea and, you know, I'll catch up on my reading with a highlighter and a notebook because I can't do anything else. So that, that time in the morning is really important for me to check both, you know, my physical levels as well as my spiritual levels. Um, my first cup of tea is always important. Um, and some days I'll choose just for the flavor, but other days I'll choose according to um, what's in the tea blend. I'm blessed to have a good friend who owns a tea shop. Um, thesaurus, uh, thesaurus, actually, tea being uh, the French word for tea. Mm. Um, and her mascots are dinosaurs. Aww. So... Uh, she makes all sorts of incredible tea blends and she will often do it with intention. Like, okay, if I put this in here, I know that this is going to affect the energy in this, this way, shape or form. So sometimes I will choose something just because it tastes delicious, but other days I'll be, okay, I need this and this to help nudge my energy into where it 
it's going to need to be for the day, depending on what's on my to-do list or the state I'm in when I wake up. Um, throughout the day, there will be moments where, okay, I know I need to either clear the house energy. So, you know, I'll go to the, the family altar and there'll be incense and candles going. Um, often it'll just be literally a, a, a touch on the, uh, the altar plate that we have. Um, and, a, and a quick hello to the house spirits, check in on the energy that we have tied into the altar. Um, later in the day, um, bedtime for my youngest daughter, um, she has a very difficult time turning off her mind to go to sleep. Mm. So often she'll say, mommy, can you, can you talk to the goddess for me? <laughs> So, yeah, I'll just, I have her on speed dial, huh? I'll, 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 yeah. I'll call her up and let her know that you're having difficulty tonight. And sometimes, sometimes she, she just needs the comfort of a brief familiar ritual yep. to help balance her energy. And I think, I think as a, as a parent, that's something that, that really changed my practice too, because before I had kids, I could do anything magical, ritual, spiritual, anytime I wanted during the day. Once I had kids, that I had to fit my practice into the the chinks and the corners and the nooks and the crannies. And I think that's how a lot of my, if I weave this into my everyday life, I don't have to make room for it. Mm -hmm. It's already there. Amen. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you know, helping my kids regulate their energy using yeah. symbols or colors or or tools of some kind stones plants drawings writing things and folding up the paper and carrying it with them or burning it you know helping them learn how to how to not just regulate but intentionally alter their energy to be in a better place to handle what life is throwing at them Bingo. I think that's that's another really really important thing that that it's it's a big part of my life and and again if someone said well could you teach me how to do it I'd be like oh gosh I I think a lot of it is is just teaching by demonstration yep you know this is what mom does you know it's the type of thing you can do too well, let's work on some breathing Let's work on some visualization. Let's go lie down on the grass outside and and feel our bodies get heavier and heavier and let the ground cradle you and take away all your anger or your worry. Or if you're super happy, lie on the grass and share it. Share it with the ground. Share it with the sky. Share it with the birds. I love it. You just gave some great examples. I'll just kind of make sure everyone realizes what you just did. Like that's, those are the examples of how you live it every day. And yeah, it can be exactly. that simple and that powerful. And um, I love it because it's all about intention, right? And, and, and taking your agency back, which is what yeah. I love. You know, it's like you have the best cure for anxiety is action, you know, focused action. I mean, you feel better when you, are doing something to help relieve your anxiety. Okay, I'm going to do this. So this is this is great, and this is why I love this work because um, I'm all about empowering us to to affect our energy. So all these very simple things they, they they are simple, but at the same time they're so powerful. Like as you say, like taking the agency back. So like I can't necessarily think my way out of an anxiety attack. Yep. But I can sit down with a candle and some incense and maybe a yep. pen and some paper. And, and say, I am anxious. I am overwhelmed. Can I give some of this back? That you have a ritual or something to like a go-to, something a go -to. To, to do. Like you don't just feel like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't have any recourse. I have no outlet. I have no um, tools or, you know, so this is very, very important. I think that's part of the, part of why the magic works because of the Focused intention and... Uh, and the, the awareness, belief. as you said. Yep. A awareness of what you are currently experiencing yep. as well as what is currently around you. To someone who doesn't necessarily do this on a regular basis, it might sound like it's a lot of work, but it's actually not a heavy focus on things. Yep. 
it's very much being in the moment. It's a very subtle energy that we are not trained in. And a lot of people aren't, uh, they can't relate because we don't feel these subtle energies, but it doesn't mean that you can't, you, you just have to cultivate it. Right. By right. like you said, first step is awareness. So please, maybe you can help us develop our sensitivity to these subtle energies. So we start to cultivate the ability in ourselves. Are there any tips for that? I think, I think a lot of it is working to still the, uh, the hamsters that, that turn the wheels on our brain. Yep. And, uh, and again, I, I know that's hard. I am a chronic overthinker. Yeah, we um, are. Mm -hmm. And, and it can be very, very difficult to get to that place where you let thoughts surface in your brain, but then just let them go. You don't act on them. You don't assign a value judgment to them. That's something that's extremely difficult in our society as well. We're, we're constantly, oh, what will people think of me if, and like, well, no, it's in your head. Just let it go. Just let it go. And, and sure, those, those thoughts may keep coming back, but you can say, yep, there they are. But I am choosing not to act on them right now. Yeah. And, and these intrusive thoughts, the negativity, it's something that you're going to deal with your entire life, right? It's, and it's not easy. It's really not easy, especially if you've been going through a time we were talking before about the highs and the lows. If you're in one of the lows, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to think that I can, I can, I can disconnect from some of this stuff that's going on. I think, I, th I think the busyness, like the hamsters in our brains, but the busyness in the world around us is very, very overwhelming. Um, especially since we have such a robust media that is constantly delivering information at us. It's, it's not it's too fear mongering us. too. It's a lot of it is fear mongering, yeah. but a lot of people on on this kind of alternative spiritual path are very very emotionally sensitive. We tend to be drawn to this sort of this sort of practice, and with with the news in the past couple of years alone has been heart rending. And I know a lot of people who have had to work very, very hard to protect their own energies and their own well-being simply from the news and the knowledge that there are atrocities being committed across the world. And we personally cannot do anything about it. And feeling the collective unconscious. Because mm -hmm. if you're an empath, you're going to be tapped. I know that's happened to me. Like, oh, yeah. I, I'm not an anxious person, but I've been feeling... And I was talking to one of my mentors and that's what he said. He's like, you're, I think you're tapping into the collective. And I'm like, yeah, because I don't know, like, I, I'm sure I'm, I got a lot going on. Everybody does. Right. But sure. it was a different, it was different. And so yep. we, you're tapped in as an empath and there's a lot of heavy energies going around right now. Big. Time. There are, there yeah. are. And, and, and it's interesting. I, I just realized that we, earlier we were talking about reaching out to the energies around us and connecting to them so that we can work with them. And now here I am saying there are times where you actually have to not do that or yeah. be very picky about what you do connect to because you can be completely swept away sure. and drained and crushed by this type of thing. Yeah, And so we have to balance that responsibility to ourselves and our own well-being and the well-being of the people we take care of, because if we yeah. are not in any shape to do that, then we're doing them a disservice as well. And our responsibilities to the wider community and the world at large, because ultimately that's one of our goals as an alternative, as a nature-based practitioner. We want to, we want to support the energy of nature and of the earth and the people on it we want to heal we want to make sure that everybody has the chance to be the person they can be the best person the best version of themselves and so we have this 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 give and take happening and there are times where you're you're going to have to be very picky about what you do and how you do it and you're not being selfish when you do that 
You're not being selfish if you have to disengage and step back for a while. Because if a doctor works 24 hours a day for an extended period of time, they start becoming a danger to the people they're actually trying to heal, right? Because they are no longer, they are no longer in the best um, uh, physical or mental state to actually accomplish what they're trying to do. So it, it isn't selfish to step back and recalibrate your own energy. And this is actually something that, that I've been really working on the past couple of years personally. And I think I'm going to stick it in the book soon is the natural cycle of the year. Yep. The, the, the time between the end of harvest um, and sort of around mid-February is a very fallow time of year. It's a time of year where um, in sort of the, the story of nature, the plants go to sleep, everything goes dormant. And then as the sun starts returning after the winter solstice, the hours of sun become longer, the plants start responding to that. Mm -hmm. And they begin the reanimation cycle that will eventually result in them growing and breaking the ground again and you know moving forward in the growth cycle again so if the natural world does that there's it makes perfect sense that we should do it too and it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to the seasons um it is for me because i respond so strongly to uh light i I, there's that wonderful saying that we're just complicated house plants, right? Yes, <laughs> I respond I very that, that strongly so true. Yes, to the indeed. amount of light out there, mm. and and so <laughs> I find myself in the winters. The older I get, I start to really pull back and disengage. Yep. Um, and and withdrawing your energy from the things that you've plugged it into, older projects that maybe have stalled or that have moved on in a way, but you're still sort of plugged into the bits and pieces that are behind, being able to withdraw your energy and bring it all back and tuck it in and and let it sit and sort of nourish itself and renew itself until you feel ready to move out again into the world and choose where you're going to put your energy into to help it flourish, not just your energy, but the energy you're actually connecting to. And, and I think it's really, really important to remember that that is an essential part of the natural cycle. We are not going 24 seven, 12 months of the year. That's, that's how we break ourselves. We have to have those, those periods of, of sort of going out, but then coming back in and then yeah, going out cool. and coming back in. And I think that's something really important that I've tried to teach my kids about too. The fact that no, it doesn't have to be all panic all the time. You can you can come back, you can withdraw, you can you can restabilize and balance yourself. And when you feel ready, you can move outward again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more experience you have doing that, the more confidence you can have saying, okay, well maybe I don't feel entirely ready, but I know I have to do this thing anyway. So you can take those steps using whatever energies around you to help support yourself, even if you personally don't feel 100% ready. Because, I mean, let's face it, if we wanted to wait until we were 100% ready, a lot of us, I think, would just stay in our blanket forts. <laughs> Particularly if you're a perfectionist. And I'll just add, you know, being cognizant of and respecting and putting those hard boundaries up as to the the cycles of nature as a woman is even more important. The majority of people who watch and listen to the show are female. And, um, well, we know, I mean, that's what menstruation, all that is about teaching us about cycles of power inside and out. And for women, even more so, you know, even just, you know, following the moon and scheduling things around full and dark moons. And it's, it's actually a big part of my course that, that I have that to help teach people that this stuff's very, very real. And to your point, the bottom line is, as you've said, 
we are nature. Like, doesn't that make sense? Like, why wouldn't you try to, at least to the best of your ability, design your life a little bit in sync with a little bit of a nod or a wink to the natural cycles of things? Because guess what? It's going to work easier. Yeah, you, you're not it. bigger than nature. So it makes kind of sense, you know? It does. It does. And I think, you know, what we've been talking about, like just, just going through your life with awareness mm. of what's around you, the energy around you and your own energy levels. Mm -hmm. I think it removes friction. That's yep. exactly it. You're not, you're not constantly pushing against energy. If you, if you have a yes. better handle of how it moves in your life, you can, you can tweak what you do in order to flow with it a little better. Like a stream, for example, or, you know, it's spring. Let's talk about spring runoff. Spring runoff doesn't go straight through everything it encounters. Yeah. It will find the path of least resistance. And, and that's something that energy and, and the magical use of energy too. It's, it's, it's a great truth to keep in the back of your mind. Nothing you do is ever going to happen with fireworks and you know fanfares it's going to be slow it's going to be quiet and it will find the path of least resistance and that might mean you won't see results for a while but it doesn't mean they're not little things are not happening where you don't see them in order to achieve what you're going for and that's what we were talking about at the beginning of the show you know it's it's interesting because um you know all the ancient cultures they acknowledged and lived by the cyclical nature of life. They lived by, I mean, that's what the wheel of the year is, as you know, you know, and the spring uh, celebration in Beltane and the harvest in the fall and all their rituals and, and cultural mm -hmm. things were, were evolved around. It was just part of their life. It was like, duh. Yeah, of course. Like this is yeah. what nature is doing. This is what we're doing. It's and, because and it's we, agricultural based. And when you're, when your yeah. life is tied that closely to the land, yeah. it just makes sense. And we've been completely removed from that. So I would just love to know what, what would be some of the most surprising things you've learned, Aaron, along the way? That's a good question that the silly little things I do can actually have a beneficial impact in my life. And again, it's, it's not that things I do create enormous change. They ease my life and they ease the life of my family. Yeah little little things can make a difference and and True. like it can just be True. we talk to the snails outside when we go past them that's awesome we hug the trees when when we come home from school um we thank everything around us as we go by it yeah. like oh look at you you're sprouting thank you you're doing I, such a good you job like me you sound like it. me yeah. Oh my yeah. God. I'm a crazy person. I'm talking to everything and there's no one there. <laughs> I don't think we're the crazy ones. I think yeah, people right? don't recognize those things as they go by them. There's, there's so much in the world around us that can offer us support. beauty and, and support. beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, these things that can improve our lives in a way that buying a new car doesn't necessarily yeah. you know i mean yes there are times where we need a new car because the kids are bigger we just can't fit everybody in that back seat properly anymore we need to upsize okay and fine. it's cool like it'd be you know if you like new cars and they yeah. go fast and i mean there's nothing wrong with that i mean that's normal, exactly you know? but i think i think a more long-term lasting happiness comes from noticing and appreciating the small things around you and and thanking them and and by extent appreciating yourself because that is really really hard to do it it is and and yeah. as you said as mm -hmm. as women taking that time recognizing our own value is very very difficult 
um, the socialization that that our society goes through is is something fierce. Mm -hmm. And and working to allow yourself to take up your own space. You know, and and be there to just witness the other women in our lives who may also need support and and encouragement to take up their own space. You know, being able to say, hey, you know what, you're connected to this glorious thing around us and you are a reflection of that and it is a reflection of you. And if you can see the beauty and the strength in that, then you can recognize that it's in you as well. And, and I think that's one of the most surprising things I've, I've come across, knowing that all these tiny things I do because they feel right or they feel it's, it's an expression of my happiness, my pleasure at seeing these things, my joy at being able to participate in life with them these tiny little things have actually had a beneficial impact on my psyche, on my spirituality, and thus have improved me as a person and made me better able to answer the needs of the community around me, my family, and the energy of the places that, that I curate as well. And what you just described is awakening Aphrodite. I mean, that's really what it's about. You know, it's like, Wherever there is beauty cultivated and feeling and passion and something that literally awakens your soul because of the connection and you mentioned reflection, that's all Aphrodite, you know, with her mirror. And there's such misunderstanding about her energy that it's, you know, vain or superficial, but it's not. Like, and we're talking about, we've been talking about cult curating our environments, which because you are curating your energy and then you're curating yourself and noticing and being aware and appreciating and taking it in and um, working with it and being in harmony. To me, that's all Aphrodite energy. Have you personally worked at all with Aphrodite energy in your priestess work? I, I have not. I had to um, ask you that, you know, I, you knew geez, that was coming. It makes perfect right? sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> or not her specifically okay. yeah. um i have worked in in general most often i've worked with uh bridget yep um as a as a creative goddess um and for a while for for very specific study purposes i worked with freya who well, does she's, she's related, parallel yeah, aphrodite yeah. Uh -huh. very very closely yeah um in the in the Greek pantheon, I I vibe with Hestia. Oh, okay, Hearth. Yep. Yeah, more than more than anybody yep. else, because there you are. It's it's honoring the local spirit of your house. It's yep. honoring um, the energy that you curate so that you and your family have the best place possible in which to grow and feel safe and and be supported. I can see. Um, that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the home is a sacred place, and and that mm -hmm. can be also be difficult for people because they don't feel like they don't feel safe at home, Ooh, yeah. or they don't have um, a more permanent home that they can feel connected to. Yes. Um. So so working out where you feel like home is for you can be can be quite a journey. Yeah. Um, I just it can also be challenging yep. if. If yep. you move on a regular basis, mm -hmm. for example, if you if you travel for work, if you are a member of a military family and are posted every couple of years and you have to sort of uproot your your energy connections and then start all over again in a completely different area of the country where the environment's going to feel different. The energies move in a different way. The local mm -hmm. plants are completely different. Um, it can be a challenge. It can be a challenge, but again, working from the inside out, your immediate local environment, you you have to make that as as good as you can, in order to and and you know what? If that just means it's your room, or if it means it's an object that you can carry with you from place to place, 
if you if you are if you are a temporary lodger or if you do have to move from place to place frequently if you don't have a a, a home per se you know it's kind of about hacking the system it's kind of like well how can i reinterpret this so it fits into what i do yeah and and how can i how can i tweak these energies so that it best benefits me so that i am in a place where i can reach out and help others Mm -hmm. absolutely so back to taking back your agency so i'm curious too because you've been doing this a very long time what what is one or two of the most amazing things that have ever happened to you in your practice like maybe in a coven or some of your rituals that just amazed you like oh my god i'll never forget that (laughs) there was a i i think I, I do so much work alone that um, when I do get together with other people, which has been very challenging in the past five years because, yeah. you know, we had COVID, um, a bunch of a bunch of the people I practice with have had kids or have moved or, you know, there's been upheaval all over the place. So when I do get together with people, it's always wonderful to, after we've done a ritual of some kind, to compare notes. What did you see? What did you feel? And to realize that your experiences all overlap in such a way that, okay, I'm not imagining things. You know, being being able to compare notes afterwards and say, oh, you saw that too? Oh, you felt that too? It's, it's, um, it's so, it's so rewarding to realize that when you do have the opportunity to work with other people that you that you vibe with so well um that you can give each other that kind of experience that you are you are so in sync that the group mind is is so it's 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 running so well that you can that you can say oh we all did have that experience And then again, it's also fun to say, well, what was different? Because that that will reflect what the individual brought to that ritual and what that individual needs to address in their own lives. There was one example where uh, we were calling quarters. And we have very specific animals that are associated with the quarters. And we had a relatively new person with us who wasn't completely plugged into the group mind, hadn't done a whole bunch of the study, hadn't, hadn't done a whole bunch of the meditations, you know, ahead of time. They were, they were pretty new. And we called the quarters and he kind of took a step back at one point and we thought, okay, well, you know, just readjusting. It's not a huge room. It's okay. But afterwards he said, I have never seen something actually show up up at a quarter we said oh what did you see and he described the animal in the way that most of us think of visualize it in our heads so he hadn't talked to us he hadn't he didn't have any of the background we had but he saw what the rest of us were visualizing without being prepared ahead of time and to see his wonder and his amazement and and a little bit of the okay that's really weird Mm -hmm. (laughs) because he he never had an experience like that before you know he'd never been in an environment i think where the the people he was working with were that in tune Mm. i don't know but it was it was it was really really interesting wow um another time Very often around Samhain, we do divination-based rituals. And we will call the ancestors to be present. So that's Halloween, just for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. We will call the ancestors to be present with us in the circle, you know, to, to, to attend if they wish, you know, and if not, just to leave their blessing. And the rocking chair in the corner started to go. Oh, boy. <laughs> that was fun. Mm-hmm. 
that was fun. So everybody kind of said hi oh, <laughs> to whoever they thought was in the chair. And, you know, just, just little things like that make you realize that, oh, hey, I'm not just imagining it. Mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there are things that we can't necessarily wrap our minds around yep. that, that you can sort of point to and say, that was a moment that reinforced my belief in what I'm doing. And, you know, in my study of the elementals and, you know, some people call them, you know, spirits or nature spirits or house spirits, plant spirits, whatever you want to call them. From what I understand, they don't really let themselves be seen if they're not invited per se. So it comes from us kind of opening that door and then, of course, having to be careful who you're inviting in. Right. And, and that... And I'd love to know your thoughts on that, um, you know, just even just selling your soul, so to speak, right? Some people sell out their soul, but uh, the dark force, whatever you want to call that entity thing, can't take it unless you open the door for it to be taken. So there's a sense, uh, there's a component of giving your will, like like allowing it, so to speak, you know? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, on your experience? Because that's, from my studies, that's kind of how I've interpreted what's happening here. Um, I'm of two minds of this. And and this was something that we used to have great debates about uh, when I worked in the in the New Age shop. The, the concept of negative entities looking for a way in yeah. Versus um versus people kind of assigning negative stuff in their life to um an evil spirit or something like that or someone cursing them. I think I think a lot of it I think we create a lot of our own problems. <laughs> um we can we can create aggregates of negative energy ourselves um, and project it onto something else. And that can sort of become the shadow that follows us around. Mm -hmm. um, my partner uh, is extremely protective. So when we work together, I mean, everything is warded six ways from Sunday. It's, it's just, it's just the way we are, you know, Again, we were talking about the silly little things you do just within the day. Every time I go through a door, you know, I kind of reinforce the the don't come here unless you have, you know, actual legitimate business. Um. So so that's kind of a way of life that that concept of that concept of no, nothing gets in here unless we invite it in. Um. And and because there are at least two practitioners in our house that do this sort of without thinking, just as a, a matter of course, yeah, everything, <laughs> there, there was a great moment where there were four of us in a car driving to a festival, and we wanted to get there quickly, and we weren't actually talking to each other. All four of us put, um, basically wrapped the car in don't notice us cool we have somewhere to be you put the cloak on we yeah we shielded the car and we all shielded it so hard that at our first rest stop my partner was like i don't understand why it's so hard to drive i thought you were going to say we couldn't find where we parked we couldn't find the car <laughs> we went to the bathroom <laughs> Where's the camp no, it was it was all of a sudden and, and like he said like I, i'm the car is pushing and pushing and i feel like we're not getting anywhere and then we all we all realized that we were all shielding the car so hard wow. that it was just kind of pulling it in and back mm. mm -hmm. so i mean that's the kind of thing that happens when you've got a like a, a bunch of really sensitive people who are very comfortable with working with yeah. energy and back to the idea of intention, like the power, like people don't realize the power that we have. And that's a big part of my work as well. And I know yours is, is that just making us aware that we are so much more powerful than we know we are. 
Yep. And hopefully people listening and watching can open their awareness of the possibility that you might be capable of having more of a positive impact on your life than you think. Yes. Yes. Even if you have unknowingly created that negativity that is hanging around you. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's a, re that's a responsibility thing that a lot of people, they don't want to, they don't want to admit, they don't want to accept. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, there's, there's a whole psychology tied up in it and it's, it's hard. I mean, everybody is a, is a, is a unique case. So, you know, I, I can't paint a broad brush and say, this is what we do. This is what we can do. But if you did unknowingly create that negativity that's hanging around you with awareness and with conscious application, you can get rid of it too. You can work through it. Yeah. And, you know, you it might be hard. It might be like that car trying to drive with all that stuff wrapped around it. But you can get there slowly but surely um techniques like like i'm sure you talk about in your courses like i talk about in my books um a willingness to accept failure that didn't work that doesn't mean it can't be done you just figured out a way that doesn't work that's just part of it you gotta know right? that you're gonna have failure that's not an indicator to give up that's just part of it <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We have to keep moving. Energy is yeah. never stagnant. Mm. It never stops moving. Even even like, you know, on a on a physics level, everything is vibrating, right? Yeah. So it doesn't energy does not stop moving ever. Which means that if you feel stuck, you can you can vibrate yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're stuck like in a shell or like in the in the in the the shell of a nut for example it might feel like it's tight it might feel like you've got nowhere to go but by vibrating you can very slowly chip away little bits of that shell until you finally find a weak spot and start breaking through and if that shell keeps forming you just keep vibrating your way through it you know, it's a, it's an it's an ongoing process. This isn't something you can do and say, well, there we are. Everything's going to live happily ever after. It's a constant curation of energy. It's a constant move to improve yourself and your life and the space around you. And I actually think that's wonderful because everything is always changing. And that's encouraging. Because on, on one hand, oh, if everything's changing, then why am I fighting? Well, everything's changing, which means it can be different. Mm -hmm. It means that that fight is worth something. Mm -hmm. And the step you take today might be two steps tomorrow. And then it may be one step back, but then another step forward. You're moving. And even if you do step back, you're still moving. You're not stuck, right? Mm -hmm. Try taking a step sideways and mm -hmm. see where that gets you. Mm-hmm. I love it. What a great conversation. Erin, any final thoughts that would make you feel like uh, just complete in what we've talked about today or anything on your heart? I want people to know that there's so much around them. There, there are people who I know feel lost and feel like they have no choices. And even taking that moment to say, no, I'm worth it. Even taking a tiny step, even looking out the window and seeing a blade of grass, looking up into the sky and seeing a cloud go by, watching the trees move in the wind, you're connected to all of that. And if you reach out to it, it will embrace you and it will help give you what you need to change and make a better life. And that may be in tiny nibbles every day, just tiny, tiny nibbles, but that's how you get where you're going, right? Mm -hmm. Tiny little steps, one at a time. You can do it. So true. So true. 
All right. What's next for you, Aaron? You got another book coming out for us or what? what's coming down the pike? I do. I do. Um, I'm actually very excited about the uh, the Oracle deck that came out oh, in I didn't hear about that. Um, Oh, it's absolutely glorious. And the reason I bring it up is because the illustrator of that Oracle deck, Sarah Richards, is doing the illustrations for a brand new expanded edition of the Green Witch. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the the uh, the illustrated Green Witch. It's going to be Amazing. a beautiful big hardcover. There's going to be so much gorgeous art in it. Mm. Um, at the beginning of the year, I wrote a whole bunch of um, new spells and rituals and exercises and things that are going to be included in it. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot wait for this book because Sarah and I clicked um, when she she did a little bit of interior illustration for uh, The Green Witch's Garden, which came out a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I loved what she did. And then we got to work together again on the Oracle deck that came out last year. And, and now she's lending her magic to this wonderful new edition of The Green Witch. So that's coming out this November, I believe. Okay. And I can't wait to see it. Oh, man. I yeah, that I I can't wait to see that illustrated Green Witch. I can't even imagine how beautiful that's going to be. That'll that'll be engaging on a different level if it's got those visuals, you know. Yeah, yeah, I love it, Aaron. Thank you so very much, everybody. Please check out in the show notes. We've got all of Aaron's contact information. And but if you're listening or watching this, you probably already know who she is and have a couple of her <laughs> books anyway. Uh, but I'm just super grateful for you taking the time and sharing with us. And I can see now your cat has made an appearance before we say goodbye. And which There's one Minerva. is Minerva? That? Yep. That's Minerva. <laughs> <laughs> love it find yeah. her boundaries <laughs> yeah that's fantastic oh man i i really want to get a cat i think that's going to be in my future i think you day. should yeah yeah hopefully she'll get along with the dog she'll probably run the show right no. i was going to say she'll tell yeah. the dogs who's boss <laughs> are any of your cats male yes i have i have a, an enormous black cat called Gigi. i love it and just real quick i know i'm letting you go but is your experience different the male cat energy than the female cat energy but I don't know how much of that is due to um, the fact that it's just a different cat. Yeah, yeah. And all yeah. my cats have had different energy. Yeah. I've had I've had big goofy male cats. Okay. Um, I've had um, dumb as a rock male cats. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, it's just like a person. It just, you know, just yeah. like a okay. person, exactly. Okay. You know, I mean, Minerva is very self possessed and yeah. and intelligent, but I have a I have a smaller black and white little girl cat who has nothing in her head except love and good vibes. Oh. You know, so it's it's very much dependent on the individual, just like people. Just like people, yeah, because I have four dogs, only one boy, and I'm thinking, if I get a cat, I can't get another girl because of my poor little boy. But, all right, well, to be continued. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. As is life, right? We keep going. As is life, we just yep. keep going. That's right. Yep, yep. Thank you so very much. What a great conversation. It's flew by. I know people Thank are you, love Amy. It, it awesome. was wonderful. Okay. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite. Would you like to support my mission to help empower people all over the world to be all of who they truly are? If so, please subscribe to the show, leave a review on iTunes and share it with a friend. And if you're looking to take immediate action to align your energy and optimize your health, visit amyfournier.com. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite. Let's awaken her together in you. I'm your hostess, Amy Fournier. And I already can't wait to be with you again and for you to hear what I have planned for the next show. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. To learn more about Amy, check out her website, amyfournier.com. That's A-M-Y-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R.com. You can also check out Amy's live and on-demand virtual fitness and yoga classes and sign up for her newsletter to receive a free mini ebook of three of her top tips for making holistic health a lifestyle. Again, that's amyfournier.com and get your ebook sent to your email immediately. Connect with Amy on the daily on Instagram at fitamytv, F I T 
AMYTV and watch many of the podcast episodes and subtopic clips on her YouTube channel, which is also Fit Amy TV. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite.